Hey everybody, this week we're going to be looking at speaker upgrades and what we look for in a speaker when it shows up and look at the different levels of upgrades that we can do. Uh, before I get started though, I want to give a shout out to all the uh, students at the Acoustic Engineering Society's chapter at Purdue University. I think this is the third or fourth year that these guys have ordered our AV1 kits and allowed the students to build AV1s as a project, learning how to build speakers and put them together. And This year they were posting pictures on Facebook and it was great to go through all those pictures and see the young students out there building speakers and learning about this stuff. That That's just that's fantastic. I love seeing every picture. And to all you students out there, um, I hope you enjoy those AV1s. And to all the high schools and stuff out there that are interested in doing something like this, that want to do a speaker building project, I'll be glad to work with you guys on any of that stuff. Uh, just contact me here at GR Research if you have any interest in doing any of those projects. Now, let's get down to some business here. These, uh, these are speakers that have showed up uh, for measuring and testing and hopefully for doing some upgrades. This one's been in here for a little while. I finally got to the clip speaker. Um, let's start with the little BIC speaker on the end over there. That one is a BIC model. It is the DV62SI that a customer sent in. And I'm gonna slide over, get to the, uh, I guess to the left of the screen a little bit and give a little room to post some measurements as I talk about these. And then you guys can kind of follow along with me and see what I'm talking about and go through the measurements on each of these speakers. The little big speaker, if you look at the frequency response on this thing, you'll see it's got a couple of big peaks at the top of its frequency range, right up around um, 15 kHz and somewhere around 6 or 7 kHz. Those are some pretty big peaks. Uh, those are 7, 8 dB peaks almost. Uh, some of it may have to do with a little diffraction issue. They did not uh, flush mount the drivers in this model. They're just surface mounting. So that's going to cause some ripples in the response uh, around the tweeter. Probably not all of it is diffraction though. The tweeter's got some peaks in it. Uh, the grill uh, had very little effect on it. There was a little bit of an up and down uh, around uh, 2700 to 3400 hertz there that the grill caused a little bit of problem. but nothing compared to the frequency response and the real issue that I had with these speakers is it, the crossover point looked pretty high on these I could see from the measurements um, but there was a pretty big suck out in the off-axis response when you when you uh, when you measure the speaker and you start measuring it off-axis that means you're turning it um, 10 degrees at a time uh, the woofers output is gonna fall off in the off-axis and what you want is you want the tweeter to play down low enough that when the off axis of the woofer falls off, the tweeter's there to play that range and pick it up so it maintains a smooth curve even in the off axis. That's not what was going on here with the big speaker. Um, as the woofer fell off in the off axis, the tweeter wasn't playing low enough to fill that gap. So if you look at the horizontal off axis, you'll see that about 20 degrees off axis, it's really starting to develop a hole. At 30 and 40 degrees off axis, it's developed more than a 15 dB hole in the response just because the crossover point is so high. The vertical off axis didn't look too bad. That's, of course, as we're moving the microphone up higher. That shows the time alignment and the phase issue between the drivers and how well they stay in phase over a pretty good range. Um, these did stay in phase pretty well as you started to move up. Uh, it started to lose some of that output um, at one of the peaks and smooth out just a little bit in the off axis vertically. Um, in the impedance curve, there was an impedance resonance uh, right near the port tuning at about 68 hertz. There's a little bit of a resonance going on there. And if you look at the spectral decay, you'll see there's some stored energy uh, at the bottom of the tweeter's range that would. Um, sound a little aggressive, a little hot, a little bit of a ringing going on there. So what would we do with these speakers? What do I recommend? I mean we could go in and just replace the tweeter, put a better tweeter in there that'll play down lower and cross it down into that woofer and make something out of these things. However, now we're talking about uh, 
changing out the tweeter, designing a whole new crossover. Basically, we're designing a whole new speaker. We're just salvaging the box, which isn't braced uh, too well to begin with. Uh, I don't, in matter of fact, I don't think there was any brace in this box. And the woofer is just a pretty inexpensive polycone woofer as well. So even if we threw a really great tweeter at it, uh, you're still limited by the woofer. My recommendation on this before I would start changing drivers, new crossovers, and the, the time and the money you spend doing a big upgrade like that and trying to make something out of them, you could have spent that money on one of our kids uh, for less money and have 10 times the speaker. So in this situation, I would say before spending a lot of money upgrading this model, I would say start over. There are some other options out there you could spend that money on and get you a little further down the line. Uh, the next model here is this little Polk. It's a model uh, signature S20. And uh, if you look at the frequency response of the Polk, you'll see that it measures really well. The on axis frequency response is really smooth. There was a little peak at the tweeter's response uh, at the very top end, around 14 kHz. Not much, though. Uh, not anything I would concern myself over. That's pretty high in frequency. Um, the woofer uh, appears to be a little polycone woofer. It um, is a stamp steel frame. There's going to be a little bit of ringing in the frame. The customer that sent me this looks as if they've already put some little lead strips on the frame, and it did a great job of damping out the ringing on that frame. Uh, that's a good tweak that almost anybody can do on these things. Um, the grill uh, worked pretty well. It had a few little ripples along the way there that it, 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 uh, where it had a little bit of effect, but overall, uh, the grill's made pretty nicely, it's held on magnetically, and it had very little effect on the response. Uh, this is a little plastic cover that goes on it after you mount the woofer. It flush mounts the uh, tweeter, it looks real nice. Uh, they did a good job on the aesthetics, the cabinet looks really nice. Uh, it's got a layer of foam that's been put on the inside. I don't know if that came that way, I think maybe a customer may have already done that. Uh, but at any rate, it uh, looked really good. Uh, the off-axis horizontally looked looked pretty smooth. Uh, vertically the off-axis looked pretty good as well. The, uh, as you started moving higher and higher you started seeing in the measurements there you can see a little bit of a dipped area uh, at the crossover point but not real bad. Overall they did a pretty good job with uh, the crossover design and everything. The response is real smooth. Um, if you look at the spectral decay you'll see a little stored energy starting around 700 Hertz or so in the woofer's response but it's not bad. It's not bad, and there's a little trace there, uh, somewhere near the crossover point, a little bit of a ring, but not much. Overall, pretty good job. The one issue that I had with these was in the uh, impedance curve. If you look at the impedance curve, you'll see uh, right at, down there, just above the tuning frequency, there's a pretty big little dip in the response there. It's a pretty aggressive dip. Uh, it drops to 2.2 ohms right there, and a lot of it is caused by this little piece that goes on the back. I can see what they're trying to do here. They're, they're, uh, they've got this pointed uh, protrusion that faces straight into the port that tends to want to deflect that output to the sides so you could put the speaker up close to a wall and hopefully it would minimize the gain that you would get from the port. Of course, the frequency range that uh, it's going to have output on this port is so low, it's going to be omnidirectional as soon as it leaves anyway. So I'm not really sure what the point is here and removing it brought that dip up a little bit. The dip came up uh, and it, it reached a minimal there at 3.1 ohms. So it came up almost a full ohm uh, just by taking this off. There's still some port resonance going on in here somewhere. Uh, that little dipped area is still there. I did try adding some felt on the inside and trying to see if I could figure out where it is or what's going on. The best thing I did was just took a little bit of polyfill and just slid it in the port. It reduced the port output. It knocked that dip right out of it. It smoothed the impedance out. Uh, that worked out really well. Uh, so for you guys that have these, if you're thinking about um, uh, the port output and you've got plenty of base output from the port and you would like to soften it, it will smooth out a little resonance that's in that area and should improve the sound of it a little bit, take away that, that resonance that's in that area. Overall, though, these things uh, measured really well. There's no need to reinvent the wheel on these things. 
Paul guys uh, and engineers there did a pretty good job designing the crossover for this stuff. So what would I recommend on one of these? I would say um, let's go in and upgrade the quality of the parts because the, the parts quality is very indicative of any speaker in this price range. It's it's budget level oriented. It's The whole network is just mounted on the cup. I'll throw a little picture up. You can see uh, what the network looks like there. Um, like I said, just budget level parts. So is there room for improvement there? Yes, there's a lot of room for improvement there. But obviously at the price points that they sell these, they're not gonna be able to put a couple hundred dollars worth of high-end parts in them that would double or triple the price of the speaker. So uh, what I'll do is I will go in and draw out a schematic of the network that is on here and I'll offer you guys just an upgrade kit that's just um, all new parts that you could point to point wire. It's going to be the exact same network that came with the speaker. Just higher quality parts should improve the detail levels, the resolution, the vocal region, everything across the board. Uh, clarity wise will improve. I'll throw in a little set of tube connectors to replace the binding posts and it'll be an inexpensive upgrade that should improve these quite a bit. Now, next is the little Klipsch speaker. This is the center channel that uh, Klipsch made. It's very similar to the um, little mini monitor that I did a few weeks back. I did the RP600M. This is the RP600C. So basically using the same drivers. It's just designed for uh, center channel use. And if we look at the frequency response measurement on this one, you'll see that the tweeter and the woofer don't quite reach each other. There's a little bit of a hole there where they're crossing, where they're not really summing, and they're crossing well down in the output range so that they're leaving about a 3 or 4 dB hole in the response there. The other thing I notice is the tweeter's output level is about a dB and a half hot on the bottom end. So it's a little bit of a brighter, aggressive sounding speaker, but there's a pretty big hole there um, at the crossover point. Um, sometimes a little bit of softening at the crossover point can not necessarily be a bad thing, but in this case, if you look at the horizontal off axis, you see cancellation starting in that same area. What I mean by that is, this is designed to be a center channel speaker. So ideally you want to be sitting in front of it. It needs to have a good coverage area for the people that are sitting seated, that are watching the movie. And when people start getting in the seats that are more off axis, what happens is there's a time delay between the output of this woofer and the output of this woofer. And that time delay is such that it starts causing a cancellation effect. And on this speaker, even at just 10 degrees off axis, you can see that cancellation starting to occur in that same region where there was a hole already. So instead of it being about a 3 dB hole, there's about a 6 dB hole or more, um, maybe almost 7 dB if you look at the tweeter's output in that region. And if you get 20 or 30 degrees off axis, you, you see a huge dip there. 30 and 40 degrees off axis, there's a 15 dB dip there, and there's a, about a 10 or 15 dB dip uh, at another frequency range around six to seven hundred hertz. So a lot of cancellation going on in that range. So, um, well, let's look at the rest of the measurements real quick. The vertical off axis, that's up and down. It looks really smooth. Uh, the response doesn't change. Uh, the impedance curve also looks really smooth. I don't see any problems with the impedance other than there's an imbalance. Uh, the impedance drops to 3.3 ohms at the bottom end, so keep in mind if you have a receiver that you're using with these things, and um, a lot of those receivers don't like low impedance loads, make sure your receiver can handle lower impedance load. It's also higher on the uh, higher frequency range, so it's kind of an impedance mismatch again. Um, so a lot of amplifiers are gonna see that as a little bit different load. Uh, spectral decay looked really clean on these. So I see no issues there in the spectral decay. Um, overall pretty clean. Uh, here's the port on the back there that's that flared port. It worked really well. Here's the uh, crossover again. A um, little bit of cheese there. You know, pretty much what you'd expect at these price points just like everything else. Uh, low budget crossover parts. Uh, electrolytic caps, little iron core inductors, sandcast resistors. You know, that's, that's all the cheap stuff. So.
What would I do on this one? What I would want to, what I want to do on this one is same thing I did on the other Clips models that were sent in for an upgrade. I'm going to design a new network for these things. I'm going to um, extend the driver's range over into each other so that they're summing smoothly. So even as you start to get off axis, uh, the hole that will start to be, to appear uh, because one woofer is delayed in time versus the other won't be as bad because there won't already be a hole there. And if I bring the tweeters crossover range down just a little bit, it'll also help fill that. So it'll, it'll have better horizontal coverage area. We're going to do a much higher quality parts uh, upgrade and try to keep this still in a nice budget region. We'll throw in maybe half a sheet of no res, new crossover parts, and maybe some a pair of tube connectors. That'll improve clarity and detail across the board just like we did with the uh, smaller monitor and uh, that'll be an, an easy upgrade um, just like those other models. So I'll put that together. I don't know the price yet. Probably looking at somewhere in the 120 range for an upgrade for this thing. We'll see. Um, so that's it for this week. That's kind of what we look at when we uh, examine a speaker. You know there's times we may look at it and say it's not worth spending more money on something start over money better well spent sometimes we don't have to do any new engineering work all we have to do is upgrade the parts quality and that's something a lot of you guys can do as well that's what we'd recommend on the Polk with the Klipsch a little bit of a redesign and an upgrade and we'll get these things to sound in lots better for you guys if you have a speaker you want to send us send it on in I'll do measuring and testing and give you an evaluation just like we just did that's where we start, it doesn't cost anything for me to do that for you, or I don't charge you anything to do that. That's free, just send it in. If it's big, I'm going to charge you a handling fee for having to box and unbox and rebox something to send back to you. But that's usually pretty small. So remember, that's the only way I can tell you anything about your speakers. I can't tell you good or bad what to do without having it here. I can't evaluate it without it being in my presence. I can't measure and test it unless it is here. can't stress that enough. I still have people saying, can you upgrade my speaker and how much will it cost? I don't know. I don't know how much it's going to cost until I look at it. So if you have any questions, um, throw them my way. Post them in the comments section. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you guys next week.